honored today to introduce Penny Patterson, and I know I've known Penny for a long time, and I actually know her spouse very well, Sheila, who I taught school with many years ago in Mount Horp. Penny Patterson serves as VP of Corporate Affairs and the ProMega Board of Directors. She works with the Corporate Affairs team in corporate communications, community media, customer relations, strategic information, and philanthropic support. Penny also serves as Communication Director with the Medical Research Organization, USONA Institute. She provides direction and strategic input regarding the organization's communication and media relations. Prior to coming to ProMega, Penny worked in the advertising and PR in two Madison firms, the Hibbing Group and Knupp and Watson. She filled roles in PR, account management, and communications planning, and was a guest lecturer for three years at the UW-Madison Journalism School. Over the years, she has been part of award-winning work of recognition from the Milwaukee Press Club, Wisconsin Broadcasters Association and American Advertising Federation. Penny earned her Bachelor of Arts degree from the University of Wisconsin-Madison in Journalism and Philosophy. She serves on the Board of Directors and Advisory Committees for Community Shares of Madison, Madison Rape Crisis, and the Madison Youth Choir. And I will say before Penny comes to the podium, the outreach that she does for ProMega to keep city leaders in the community up to speed has been second to none. So we are honored that you're welcoming us to your facility and let's give Penny Patterson a round of applause. Wow, that was nice. <laughs> thank you, Sean. Um, and thank you for coming out today. What a beautiful day. Um, and I'm glad you could spend a little bit of it here at Promega. I'm curious, before we get started, just sharing a little bit about Promega, how long some of you have been in the Fitchburg community? I'm sure you've seen a lot of changes over the years. What are some of the numbers? I'd love to hear. Bill doesn't count because he's been here since the Civil War. OK, so <laughs> that one doesn't count. 85, 75? 67. 67, you've seen a lot, yes. Born here in 57, moved to, to Oregon. <laughs> Migrated and came back. back. In 2007 or so. Okay, so come and gone, yeah. yeah. We, uh, that's similar to, uh, you're a boomerang citizen. We, um, we have employees, sometimes they leave and then they come back. We call them boomerang employees, so yeah. Yeah, a lot of history. You know a lot of history. No wonder you're in this organization, right? Yeah. Well, think about if there's anything in particular um, that you wanted to know about Promega. You're curious what goes on behind the doors. Happy to try to address that. Um, full disclosure, I am not a scientist. So um, there are a lot of those sciencey things I can't answer, but hopefully enough to, to share um, what we do. So I thought a little bit of high level what we do um, how we, over the years, have integrated with community and um, how we support our employees. So, and then a little bit, if we have time, on COVID, um, sort of what we did with COVID. And I do have my watch here that I'm keeping an eye on. Will anybody be, will folks be interested in doing a tour of Kornberg afterwards, just to get a show of hands? Is anyone, it would be walking over to the Kornberg, yes, okay. Walking over to that facility and we'll, uh, we'll check it out. We've got a team here to to take us over. So with that, I'm just gonna jump right in. Um, you always get the standard corporate highlights slide, don't you? Um, started in 78, so some of you were here before Promega for sure. Um, and uh, the, the thing I'd just like to do is a shout out to the UW-Madison as well. That founding 1978 was Bill, when he was Bill Linton, who was our CEO and founder. Um, he was a pharmaceutical chemistry student at the time at the UW-Madison. And he came up with this idea to make tools um, for uh, uh, researchers who were working in molecular biology. And the particular tool he said he could make was an enzyme, something that cuts DNA. And don't, that's the sciences we get, don't worry, it won't go any further than that. Um, but, we, um, but, he, but he said, you know, if I make this for you, then you don't have to make it for yourself, because that's what was happening. Scientists were fashioning a lot of their own tools before they were running their experiments. So Bill said, I can make you a pair of DNA scissors that'll work the same every time, and there won't be any variability. And so with that, he began to make tools. And he, and he went to the guy who was the head of the lab, the, the PI at the lab, and he said, I've got this idea. I kind of want to make these enzymes for everybody, um, and I'd like to sell them could I use some lab space at UW-Madison to do that? And, and his, his uh, PI said, well, I tell you what, Bill, you can use lab space here for a year, and if it's successful, you're gonna have to leave and go somewhere else for your, you know, developing your business. 
And if you're not successful, you're going to have to leave. <laughs> so Bill had a year to uh, prove out the idea, and that was in 78. And, um, and it obviously proved out. And he ended up coming to this area, to Fitchburg, where um, I don't know if any of you know uh, Bjorkston, maybe from 67, the Bjorkston, I'm seeing a nod of a yes, yes, we're, we'll just keep connecting throughout. Um, Bjorkston Labs were here, and that was uh, Bill met and knew uh, Johannes Bjorkston and began uh, Promega here. So the original lab is still here. The, many of the original buildings are still here. Um, so it's just kind of a fun way to understand how Promega started, and, and it's grown a bit since then. So we'll, we'll get into that. We're, uh, we're all around the world today um, and serving about 100 countries with our own sales and marketing branches. We manufacture in a few areas, primarily here in Fitchburg. 85% of what we manufacture is here. Um, but we also uh, have sites in Shanghai, in Korea, and in San Luis Obispo in California. Um, so who do we sell to? Who uses uh, these tools and technologies, as we call them? Well, certainly uh, people in the academic world, that's how it all started. And they used to be our biggest customer. They're not anymore, but academics all around the world. Um, the pharmaceutical biotechnology world started to use those tools as well. So as discoveries started to come out of research, they started to be applied and used in other forms of, of, of science and in pharma biotech. You heard a lot about that during COVID, and we'll get into that a little bit uh, later. Um, genetic identity, think about CSI, uh, think about Ancestry.com, um, think about Alan, who was uh, closely involved in those tools for genetic identity, um, and then applied and environmental testing. Some of you may have heard around wastewater testing uh, with COVID. Some of you heard those stories. We actually have a product that helps people do that kind of testing to see if there's a predictor in the wastewater of perhaps a COVID, uh, COVID bloom in a community. Um, and then clinical diagnostics. Again, COVID tests literally um, is a perfect example of uh, some of the things that we're in. Um, some of our ingredients are in those clinical diagnostics that are they're starting to tell what's happening in a human and starting to be predictive. Alan, you jump in if I don't get this right, by the way. So, yeah, okay, he will. <laughs> I threatened, I said, you know, maybe you should come up and do this. Yeah, I'm sure he could. This, especially this slide. So this is the, oh, okay, so you sell products to these people and they do some stuff, but really, what do you, what is it? What is it? So that you'll see in the top, um, see if I can point to it right here, reagents. So uh, a little chemistries that are in little tubes that are these technologies. Sometimes um, we also sell instruments so you can automate it, just benchtop instruments, things that can be alongside a scientist, not the big robots. But what these things do are, are all across the board. We sell 4,000 different products because this piece right here is a little representational of a cell. A single cell is crazy complicated. It has got incredible machinery in it. And researchers are constantly and chronically trying to learn more about how things work, what turns on, what turns off, what kills a cancer cell without hurting any other cells um, is, a, is a primary example. So there are a lot of tools that you need to use to understand what's happening inside of a cell. And more specifically, our tools, some of the things they do um, primarily are we sub purifying and amplifying, but purifying, being able to pull things out of a cell, being able to pull DNA out of a cell, pull mRNA out of a cell, RNA you heard a lot about during COVID, pull the pieces out. Another thing they do is often they're watching, observing. We use a, a, something called bioluminescence technology based on the firefly, um, bioluminescent shrimp. Um, it's a technology that replaced a lot of radioactive technologies, and it helps scientists see what's going on in a cell. Sometimes it helped them understand what happened after an experiment, but more and more they're able to watch real time. What's happening in life inside of a cell? I know, mind-blowing, right? Um, and then uh, analyzing. I'm sure this uh, last image looks familiar to Alan. Um, this, is, uh, this is showing a DNA analysis. Um, it's something, obviously, we talked about before, used in forensic study a lot, and uh, was used, um, some of our early products were used during the 9-11 uh, tragedy as well. And so we, are, we applied all around the world. Could talk a long time about that. Um, 
as we keep going. So we've grown a little bit from those first buildings. They were up, let's see, I think I can point to them. They're up in this area right here. This is actually the very first building called the Upper Lab. Um, but you can see there are other places where we've gone to. We are sitting right here. There we are, wave. And, um, and some of our other buildings, the Feynman you'll see in a minute. Um, Kornberg is what we'll tour today. Uh, we, we also have uh, uh, buildings over here on Nobel and off uh, it's Kepler, which is um, logistics and product finishing. So over the years, um, since 78, we've, we've grown quite a bit. You can actually go to this map on our website in the About Promega section. It is a, an interactive map, and you can, you can click on the different areas and learn a little bit more and see inside some of these, uh, some of these buildings. Uh, and this is a chance to see inside the Feynman building, which we're not going in today, uh, but we do have a little quick video uh, to explain a little bit about it, so I'll give that a go. Welcome to the Promega Feynman Center. This manufacturing facility opened in 2014 to serve the emerging need for CGMP manufacturing and provide plenty of capacity for the future. It was fitting to name the building after physicist Richard Feynman, who not only won a Nobel Prize, he saw possibilities in science before they were emerging. This facility was designed to be ready for the technologies we have yet to imagine. The Feynman Center is comprised of two distinct spaces, the Crossroads and one of Promega's manufacturing operation centers. Promega has a history of creating spaces that integrate with the environment and bring the outside in. The 52,000 square foot or 4,800 square meter Crossroads area within the Feynman Center is a perfect example of that practice. The aptly named Crossroads provides a unique opportunity for employees across the campus to meet or unexpectedly intersect throughout the day. Built with sustainability in mind, the space brings in abundant natural light, holds the glacial erratic boulders pushed to the land over 10,000 years ago, and uses a combination of straight beams and curved arches that create flow, ease, and a creative, productive, and healthy working environment. As a CGMP facility, design and flow are critical to maintain the integrity of our products. Feynman Center shows how a typical in vitro diagnostic reagent is produced, dispensed, kitted, and quality controlled. This truly unique and state-of-the-art facility coexists with the surrounding landscape and provides a productive, creative, and healthy working environment for team members and visitors alike. So, so that, that gives, gives you a little bit of an idea of what's inside that building. And we built it to deal with a lot of the regulation and um, protocols required for that clinical diagnostic piece of the puzzle. So um, when we talked about the different ways our tools are used, and um, that was also the building where we uh, had to scale up our production during COVID. Um, logistics, so once the products are made, manufactured, and, and put together, then they come over to the Kepler building, which is our logistics building. Um, and they do amazing work. You, you, to be able to send things all around the world and keep them super cold, you can see down there, sometimes they have minus 140 C. Um, that's, that's an amazing feat, and these people are incredible at what they do. Um, and there, and this, this is set up to also think about the people who are doing this every day. So along here, these are deep freezers. Everything's on a carousel so that it comes to the person who's collecting the order. Um, nobody has to go into a cold freezer. It comes to them. Um, these, blue, these big blue things that you see right here, those are, uh, those are full of dry ice, and that's where they keep the product. Um, over here as well, often when you have to get to some products, you can see this is vertical storage. So um, again, they can bring products down to them um, when they need it. Of course, there's a guy over here going to the products. <laughs> so sometimes they go both ways. Um, but that facility right now is under uh, construction. We build everything um, with the idea of the future. So long-term thinking is a critical part of, of the sort of approach and rhythm of Promega. So when this building was built, we anticipated, well, if we need to grow, let's build it so we can. Um, and we are. So uh, that one side is extending out right now. Um, that mindset also is what gave us, uh, I would say, a bit of a leg up in being able to respond quickly to the COVID uh, crisis. So uh, in addition, once people get their products then, they're supported. 
the teams who support scientists out in the field um, answer questions. How do I use a product? We get many calls for people who want to use how, want to know how to use other the com the competitors' products. We get, we get those calls too, and we answer them. Um, our technical service team has a policy that we don't stop helping you until we've both agreed the problem's been solved or it can't be solved. But it's a mutual agreement before we we walk away from that. Um, also, this is a it's a minor point on the slide, but it's a big part of Promega is our custom business. More and more, we're, we're creating customized. Uh, products uh, could be a particular tool. It could just be a, a unique quantity of a particular tool for scientists today. So I want to jump a little bit uh, into how we integrate with community um, because it comes in a lot of flavors. It comes in thinking about the environment around us. The Kornberg building that we'll be visiting next is one that was manufactured, manufactured, it was built in a way um, that tried to be very thoughtful about the world around it and how we use energy. This building, if it were built on a more traditional style, would use about 65% more energy than, than the one we have today. So it, it saves energy right out of the gate. Um, I'll point out one thing, and we'll talk about it more when we get there, but this is just kind of a fun little thing. So it's a unique construction. It's called this, you see it says double skin facade. That means that a lot of this building is like a thermos. It has two, it has two walls. And while in some ways that might seem wasteful, the, the ability to insulate and regulate is so efficient. Um, it's not a technique that's used a lot in the US, but it is used a lot in Europe. And um, we learned from our, our German colleagues. It also allows us to do things like open windows, which whoever opens a window in a commercial building, but you'll see that as well. So we'll talk more about that when we get there, but you can see there are a number of sustainable practices as we think about integrating into community. When the first R&D building was built in, it was around 88, 89, um, they tried to be thoughtful, but they didn't have as much technology then. Tried to bring more daylight into the building. Made sure that the, the building didn't cut the tree line. Things like that, that just made it a little more um, integrated into, into community. Other ways we integrate. Um, so as the company grows and it needs to do things, it also thinks about community and how to, how to incorporate community. Um, when we brought in the Woods Hollow Children's Center in the early 90s, that that um, uh, that program was not only offered to employees, but it was offered to community. Today, it's a two-third, one-third, two-thirds of the citizens, one-third Promega employees use the Children's Center. The BTC Institute also, which came up in about the 90s, that's a science education nonprofit um, that Bill had started. Um, it works with children from middle school all the way to the UW graduate science business program. And it was the first program uh, in the state to allow children hands-on experience in molecular biology. So it's, uh, since then, about 100,000 plus students have gone through uh, the BTC Institute programs. Uh, Promega in Action uh, newer, is a, a newer program, maybe seven or eight years old, and it allows our own employees to give back as they wish. So they can have grants to have a full w paid week of time to go into community in any way they want um, to give back. So um, that's something we do. As a matter of fact, that's our corporate affairs team in the lower, lower right. Um, we're at one of the local farms, actually, doing a little harvest for one of the food banks. And then the USONA Institute that um, Sean had mentioned earlier uh, is one of the latest nonprofits that's uh, come up from, from Bill, who uh, is executive director of that as well. Um, and then we have Terso, that was a spinoff that's in Fitchburg, that uh, was started at Promega, not as Terso, but had this unique inventory management system uh, that you could just track what was in a freezer, what was in a cabinet, um, and it was really based on that. Anybody use the mobile pass system? Do you have that or you remember that whole thing? The mobile, I'm like a lot of blank stares. Okay, never mind the mobile pass system, but it's, a, it's an automated tracking method. Um, 
And so the application of that inventory system was far greater than biotechnology. It's used in the medical world now. It's used in the dentistry world as well, I believe. Um, and it tracks basically um, high-cost products so that you can always have storage. You know what you've got. You know what you need. Um, so Terso has taken that concept and made it into a quite viable business. Uh, overall, every once in a while we look at our impact in Wisconsin alone, Wisconsin, uh, uh, sorry, Promega has about a billion dollar impact in the state. Um, and it's just an interesting thing as we do these assessments, taking a look at our vendors, uh, about 50% of our vendors come within a 50 mile radius of Fitchburg. And that becomes meaningful for responsiveness, for relationship, and obviously for impact to local economy. Um, I want to jump then to just quickly talking a little about our employees, because all of this happens because of our employees. And again, it was in the 90s, it was kind of a, an important time for Promega, but it was in the early 90s. I believe one of the board members had challenged Bill. He said, you know, where is, where's Promega going? What's going on with this? And, and you know, where, where, what do you want to do next? And Bill, you know, gave it some thought, and he said, you know, really, the, the business is great, but what it's about are the people who make this business happen. Because as you can see, as science discovers, we keep following the discoveries and supporting those discoveries and growing with them. So to be able to say we're going to be about X would perhaps close the door to Y and Z and A. So we look at the people and how incredible they are and how they can imagine the unimaginable. And once you do that, it becomes possible. And so Bill said, this is, this is a company about its people and supporting its people. And that's where we begin. And as a result, we try to do that. Um, always, always room for improvement, right? But um, a few of the things we do around uh, employee support include self-awareness programs, something called ESI, Emotional and Social Intelligence. Not only understanding who you are, but who are you with everybody else, too, because the more we relate together, um, honestly and sincerely, um, the better everything is. Our work environment, our work, what we invent, you know, how we feel at the end of the day. Um, that, again, huge contributor to um, dealing with COVID. When you're in a crunch and you work with beautiful people, you're willing to work harder and do incredible things. Creativity, very important. We're always living in this world that's inventing, imagining, innovating. Um, have any of you been to the art shows when we had them pre-COVID? Couple nods. They're coming back. They're coming. Yes, hands in the back of the room. Art shows. I think July. We're having our next art show. So stay tuned for that. Um, celebration. Always important to celebrate our milestones of our employees. Um, how long they've been at the company. Their families, um, as well as beer. So we probably have one of the best Oktoberfest celebrations around. You get scientists brewing beer, and it's amazing. <laughs> And wellness, um, I'll, I'll give you a little more detail on wellness, I don't want to go into all of them, but what we do around wellness up, up here, you see there's a little bit of an, uh, an article on caregiving crisis is, is the headline. You know about maternity leave in companies, they all do that. Well, we do something called um, caregiver leave because we appreciate that in life, it's not just when you celebrate having a child, but you need to be able to care for family in all sorts of circumstances. And so caregiver leave allows that latitude um, to be able to come and go and keep your job and take care of people in your life who may suddenly need care for one reason or another, whether it's temporary or it's long term. Um, we have a wellness center run by a nurse practitioner. It's Hannah, the one smiling. Um, and employees can go there anytime uh, they need uh, care, as long as it's not emergency. Uh, but they have a place to go right away, because we all know scheduling appointments sometimes can be a real pain. Um, and a lot of things can be taken care of at the wellness center. Our own gardens, uh, they do quite a few tons of food every year uh, that uh, our culinary team uh, provides and cooks up for us. And then uh, fitness, um, certainly fitness facilities in most of our primary buildings. And so that's a lot, right? That seems like, man, that, that costs a lot of money. What is your ROI, your return on investment and all those things for employees? And the reality is we don't, we don't measure that, but we know a couple other things. We know our employees do amazing things. We know they create award-winning work and tools. 
We know we haven't had recalls. We haven't had a lot of the complexity of mistakes. Um, we know our shipping accuracy is incredible. These people are concentrating every day on what they're doing. Um, and a level of commitment that's amazing. Employee turnover rate is very low, especially relative to the market. And our leaders are people who have been with the company a long time with an average 18-year tenure in our leadership. So they bring the institutional knowledge and the, and the company sensibilities to keep us glued together. So we feel investing in people is, uh, is just you know good for all of us. Um, I do have, let's see, we have a little bit of time. I do have a little bit on COVID. I was going to just give you a quick video and a couple of quick points. Is that okay before we look at tour? Okay. I heard a please, so I will take it away. This is a quick video that will give you a summary. We'll start there. materials to be able to do the testing for COVID-19. There has been a global effort in optimizing the methods and tools that enable the detection of the viral genes within wastewater systems. We started, initiated a project to detect antibodies against the SARS-CoV-2. Omega and Madison are helping meet the growing demand for tests. We provide the chemicals that allow the researcher to get that material and use it in a way that informs them of so if someone has COVID-19 or not. Promega makes a number of different reagents that are involved in all steps along the way in the testing process. So that just gives you a quick peek at uh, some of the things that happened at Promega during COVID. Um, it, more closer to home, um, appreciating that we all needed each other and we all needed to just pitch in wherever we could. Promega also provided, you know, its infrastructure to help in other areas that made sense. So we worked with the Wisconsin Department of Health uh, Services and just being one of the consultants, Epic and Exact were in that group as well in terms of figuring out how to get testing going quickly. Um, and uh, the woman, one of the women you saw interviewed there, uh, Sarah Mann, was a part of that committee. In addition, uh, late in the game of COVID, uh, Dane County Schools wanted to be able to get COVID tests to the schools, but there was no infrastructure on delivery. They couldn't figure out how to get it out because it was just it was a new game. And so we used our logistics system, those amazing people from that Kepler building you saw with the the long, uh, the long runway and the, all the products, those people know how to move product quickly and efficiently. And so they, for a couple of months, helped deliver all of the, the tests to the schools in, in Dane County till the school districts figured out how to make that happen. Uh, worked with the city of Madison and their police department, vaccinated them. We had also, when we were doing it, I will say, we checked with Fitchburg. You guys were already ahead of it and um, working with the Fitchburg Community Pharmacy. Uh, but we did end up uh, working with the uh, senior center in vaccinating volunteers later. That's all thanks to the, to the wellness center that we had on site that you saw earlier. So we sort of converted some of those capabilities into support where we could, as long as we could keep the business running and, and take care of the, the teams here. So um, this is just a shot of some of the vaccination work that was done along the way. Um, but that's pretty much, you know, that's pretty much what I had to share for today. I would love your questions before we start looking at the tour. But a, a sentiment from Bill that came 
years and years ago, decades ago, and I think it still holds true today, is that you know we don't look at quarterly statements. It's kind of the beauty of being private. To us, a quarter is 25 years, not three months. And as a result, the things that we look toward for success around what happens in community, what happens with growth, what happens with education, um, what happens with creativity. And those are the things that um, make a difference, we think, in who we are, who our business is, and uh, what we share with all of you. So thank you so much for your time. Do you have questions? Yes, ma'am. Um, you, uh, your organization started in 1978, the same year my daughter was born, so I know that you're 44 years old. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, I was going to ask, uh, your global involvement is very impressive. Can you, do you know or can you remember what the first foreign country was that you got involved with? And how soon after 1978 did that happen? And the second part of the question is, what is the most active foreign country today? Oh. All right, so uh, I can give you rough answers on these questions of, what was the first country we were engaged in when we left the States, um, and uh, who's most active today? So I, the, I don't know the exact, there's, there's the first branch, or first branches we opened. Um, I don't know if they were the first countries we engaged with, though. So our first branches were actually in Australia and the Netherlands. But by that time, uh, we had already had a number of distributors and were working with a number of, of distributors. Um, I also know that Bill was on the, uh, was the we were the first biotech joint uh, venture in China. He, Bill went on a, a mission with the Thompson administration team at the time. And uh, that started something that had never happened before as well. So those are some of the, the first. I couldn't tell you the first country though. Alan, do you know? To put you on the spot, no, I'm just curious. Yeah, I don't, I'm not sure where our first internet, I'll find out though, now you've got me curious. We're gonna do some digging. Um, the most active country, you know, I, uh, overall, um, about fifth today, about 50%, 50 to 55% of our sales are in North America. The rest are worldwide. So it's, it's split between, I mean, if you think we serve 100 countries, it's sort of split between all of them. I would say of those for us, some of the very active ones are Germany and the UK, um, but we work in all, you know, in all countries. So France and, and Spain and Italy and, you know, everybody, everyone has a contributing factor as well as China, Japan, Australia, India. Um, but I would say those might be Germany, Germany and UK are probably the top two countries. Thanks. You're welcome. When was your, what, year, what month was your daughter born since we were like a part of the same year? Uh, March 3rd. Okay, so she's older than we are. <laughs> we were born in September, so yeah. Quick question, Penny, Sean. thank you for the presentation. First of all, um, cannot thank this Bill and ProMag enough the million dollars that he put forward for the library helped get the ball rolling and you know I was fortunate enough to be there when we opened the library and as Alan said that's where our office is, is in the library so that community commitment is second to none. Our slogan with the historical society is past, present, and future and you did a nice job talking about the past and the present with ProMega in Fitchburg. Where do you see the future? Where do you think, I mean you've got a lot going on here, a building opening up over by um, Sub-Zero over there right, and all right. kinds of things. And right. why Fitchburg? You could go other places in North America. I know you have a lot in California facilities, but why did you guys decide to double down here probably eight, ten years ago? And where do you think the future will end up? Right. Well, I think in terms of future, um, the quick answer is I don't know. But it comes with uh, a very grounded philosophy in, in follow, following the science. So um, as it gets applied to more and more places, um, we'll, we'll follow that. And the thing we are, we do, we're very grounded in about the future is that it's coming and we'll be ready for it, which means, um, and this sounds kind of vague, but it means when we build buildings, we build them with space to grow. 
So we have something called white space or frontier space in our buildings. So you'll find places in some of the newer buildings that are just still down to the studs. We don't know what we're putting there yet but we know something's coming and we want to be ready to flex to it. Same thing with the Kornberg building that you're going to be going, you're going to be touring. We expect these buildings to stand 100 or 200 years. And so the, the utilities and the mechanics that come into Kornberg, there's a tunnel that was built so that someday they'll have to be replaced. So we want to be, we want to be able to replace them easily with whatever comes next. So we appreciate it's bigger than any one of us. It's bigger than any particular technology um, or any particular moment in time. Um, it, you saw how complicated that little cell is. Um, there's a lot left to discover and apply in our world today to improve our life. And so that's, that's kind of what we're ready for. We stayed in Fitchburg for a, a whole host of reasons. Fitchburg's been a fabulous city partner and development partner for Promega, um, working back and forth and, 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 and being open to the idea of, you know what, we need to build a little bit bigger so that we're ready for the future. We'd like to, you know, we'd like to trench underneath the, the road so that we can have you know, stormwater ready to plug in when we, when we build on the other side, but that wouldn't come for another 20 years. But Fitchburg has always been um, a great partner in thinking about, we gotta think about growth, and we have to do it in a way that thinks about community. Restoring the prairie swale, um, you know, spending a little more money to go around a tree as opposed to over it. Um, it could be the small or the big, but it has been very meaningful to Promega. And for our teams to be able to work so closely together has been huge efficiency and just helps us respond faster to things. Mayor. A couple of things that I yes, just wanted sir. to add. One, the art fair is August 20th, Saturday. Mark your calendars. Thank you. You're welcome. And I've talked to vendors there who actually like that better than art fair on the square. They actually do better in sales here than art fair on the square, which I thought was interesting. And then you talked about sustainability. One of the things, too, that really shows how you live that and how important that is that people don't really know is that as a city, we can only require new development to take care of 90% of the stormwater runoff of what was originally on that land. We wish we could make it 100% with the impacts and the environment right now that it should be that. But Promega actually goes above and beyond and spends extra money to go over 100% of the stormwater. Usually it's like 102% roughly. And that's just because they live those values and that's so important to them and that's something that I appreciate and I don't think gets talked about or oh, appreciated you. by others as, well, as much as uh, it should because to have you go above and beyond because of the impacts on the environment, I think is a wonderful thing. So I know you talked a little bit about sustainability and environmental impacts, but that was one thing that I think really speaks to those values. I appreciate that. We at, over at Kornberg, we do rainwater collection um, and use that gray water in the building. And then over at um, the the place you talked about that's near Sub-Zero that Sean was referencing, um, the uh, Chappelle Manufacturing Center, we actually use some of the stormwater and runoff for cooling systems um, for some of the, the uh, manufacturing methods over there. So. Um, trying to trying to make use. So thank you so much. Great to hear about Agora too. You know, I ran into an artist not long ago, and I said, "So where are you showing?" She goes, "Well, I show at the Agora Art Fair." And like that was a badge of honor. And I, I have a quick, super quick story. The Agora Art Fair started um, off of a. It was a. It was sort of a ripple effect when Bill stopped doing an employee gathering at his home because the company was getting too big. And you're like, how do you get from that to the art fair? But he, he didn't want to stop celebrating with employees in the summer, and he wanted to do something. But he said, I just, I just can't have everybody at my home anymore. It's just there are too many people. So we tried to bring it here. And the first attempt was a car show. And it kind of went OK, you know, and it was open. We started to open to a community, but it didn't really take off. And then, and then this notion of an art, art fair came in. And it just, you know, what do you have, like 20,000 people now that come to that uh, in a day or something? It's just fabulous. I love that thing. Um, and so that was, uh, talk about the ripple effect of things that happen um, when businesses open up to community. And when community is so receptive, um, makes a huge difference. Great. Any other questions? 
Well, before we give our speaker a hand for a wonderful presentation, I just have a comment about something that you uh, said uh, well back in your um, yeah. talk. You said that Bill was, uh, he decided to make some enzymes for research. And I was working at St. Jude and I was looking for enzymes to use. And um, if uh, people know uh, who I am and what I do, um, I decided to make it myself. So, <laughs> <laughs> so um, but I guess Bill got the better hand because he hired me and, and yeah. I started to got, you work You was making good enzymes in your lab, yeah. <laughs> Let's give her a big hand for it. Thank you. Thank you.